Sunday morning, if you would please. Guess what today is? Starts the Christmas season. We got the kids on stage. They're going to be singing. We have a lot of fun stuff for you this morning. Would you please stand with us as we worship our King? Amen. Two. Come on, kids. Good morning, Mac family. It's, Ma it's Christmas time at the Mac. Amen. Amen. We want to take a few moments to, uh, to say thank you to Miss Kimberly Davis and her big team that she had this week, putting all the Christmas decoration. Can we give them a hand, please, this morning? It's not just in here, but you go to the connector. It just looks beautiful. So we want to thank them as a team. Uh, also, if you're a first-time guest or second-time guest, we ask that you just take a few moments to fill out a connection card and put that in the plate. Uh, we are honored that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. Uh, a few announcements, if you will. Pastor's breakfast will be next Sunday. It's the second Sunday of every, every, uh, every month, and there's really good sausage and biscuit gravy. There's casseroles, so don't eat that morning. Show up. You want to learn more about uh, the MAC, uh, hear the heart of the pastor, that'd be a good time. So you can sign up two ways. Go online. Or you can just fill out, uh, put it in the connection card and put it in the plate. But also, ladies, there is a MAC women's event at 6 p.m. December 14th in the Connect area. Hot chocolate, coffee, and cookies. Here's the thing. Bring your favorite Christmas cookie and the recipe to share. So share with one another. Uh, Mountain Movers Luncheon will be uh, Christmas Fiesta will be December 16th, 1130 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. 
But uh, also, I just want to say this. I know that you've probably noticed that our, our, our parking curbs are a little more yellow t- this morning than they were last week. Uh, you, one parking lot has new striping. The other one's just been sprayed and been blocked off. We want to say thank you for your patience as we continue to work to, to beautify God's uh, property here and good stewards of that. So just be patient with us, and we appreciate that. But let's stand and greet one another in the Lord. Thank you. Let's have a good time. Say hello to everybody. Hey! kids are singing with us this morning aren't they doing a great job well there's a little part that we're gonna we want you to do we need you to snap with us come on
All right, church family, let's, uh, let's listen to Luke chapter 2, and then we'll join in in prayer together. It says that in the same region there were shepherds out on the field, and they were keeping watch over their flock at night. And an angel of the Lord then appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel then said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. And it's for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You're going to find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude. That means you couldn't count them, y'all. All around the heavenly host, praising God and saying together, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Friends, God certainly loves us as his created ones. And he proved that, he demonstrated, as the Bible says, by coming and taking upon flesh and blood. Today starts just a a three-week series I want to lead us through to intentionally learn all that we can about the glorious worth of our Savior, Jesus. And it starts at Christmas. So I'm so glad you're here. Looking forward to what God wants to teach us. But in this moment, let's just pray. Let's cry out to God. Let's reach for Him. He's reaching for us. He knows every need that we have. And He brings His presence in a way that brings His peace. And that peace passes all understand it. We can't in any way really truly explain it, but it's there and it's present through the person of Christ, as God's Son. So I invite you to come if you feel led, to join me at the altar, pray, lay burdens down. Let's trust God to move and be at work in us and through us as a church family. Let's pray together. Awesome God, the truth is is that I think we're a lot like the shepherds. We're out working a job and we're just living life and just doing maybe the routine things. And then suddenly you show up and you announce something new, something great, magnificent. And then you extend an invitation for us to join you in that great work. God, may we be like these humble shepherds. May we respond with worship. May we respond in haste to run and to meet you and to join you where you are. And to be a part of the activity of God that has come and to invade humanity to show the depth of your love that there's not a place where we could run to. There's not a thing, anything that we could do that would outdistance your ability to meet us, to forgive us, to cleanse us, to purify us from all unrighteousness, to renew within our heart a zeal and a love and a passion for you. God, as we sing to you these glad songs of Christmas, Lord, it just begins in our heart that we want to say thank you for grace, thank you for mercy, Thank you that before anything was made, you foreordained that you would come and you would give your life. So, Lord, may we in these days glean all that we can from Scripture to worship the Christ that did not just stay a baby in a manger, but he grew to be a man who lived a sinless life that he might lay his life down as the Lamb of God. Oh, God, we worship you today because of that. You are the name that is above every name. So we look to you. Our eyes are on you. We've come to worship you, God. Strengthen hearts, strengthen marriages, strengthen homes today. May we turn and just fall upon your bosom, Lord. And let you envelop us and to just receive you into yourself that we can be renewed and then sent out into a hurting world to be the representatives 
of Jesus. We make that our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Spoken, come taste of his perfect love. Oh, come guilty and hiding ones, there is no need to run. See what your God has done. Christ is. Would you join me in the Gospel of John this morning? We're going to take, as I said, three weeks to do my very best as your pastor to 
truly unfold what is there. I know many of you, you've read through the Gospel of John. If you're trying to find it, just turn to the latter part of the Bible. That is in the New Testament. You'll get past Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then you'll find the Gospel of John. John, one of the uh, inner uh, ring, if you will, of the apostles, men who walk with Christ, that God had sovereignly just called them to be his friends and to teach them as the future shepherds and leaders of the church. John was one who walked in great friendship and great intimacy with Jesus. And so he is highly, to say the least, highly qualified to write his own gospel, his narrative of his own encounter with Christ. Uh, I I think it's interesting when we begin to think about what we've just experienced together in worship, that every one of us would say, "I, I would have my own cardboard testimony. I think of the apostle Peter who his would say, traitor, and then faithful pastor. That he had to go away, and then Jesus had to come to him, and he had to say, Peter, do you love my children? Lord, of course you know I do. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love my children? Of course I do, Lord. Okay, feed my sheep. And then the third time, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, and feed my lambs. Three times he denied, traitor. And then three times to be fully restored, I know you do, Peter. And to the extent that ultimately we know that Christian history records that Peter himself was crucified upside down, that he did not recant, he was unwilling to run away at that point because of his deep abiding conviction and his love. And friends, I want to tell you, for you and for me, uh, certainly at Christmas time, we must be confronted with this, and that's the title of this morning's message, and I hope that you'll follow along. I am, as I said uh, in weeks past, I'm doing my best, y'all, to yield time back to you, all right? I have taken your time, and we have enjoyed time, but at Christmas time, I want to give some time back to you and your family. It's okay to say amen. 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 <laughs> now, mouth not too loud, don't you? I read this, and I just, I got to give this to you. I thought this was good. Uh, This was recorded in the Chicago Tribune. (laughs) He said, this is a dad writing about his son's experience at school. To avoid offending anyone, the elementary school dropped religion altogether and started singing about the weather during the Christmas season. At my son's school, they now hold the winter program in February, and they sing increasingly non-memorable songs like, Winter Wonderland, Frosty the Snowman, and and this is a real song for them, Susie Snowflake. Really? Susie Snowflake, okay. He said, which is funny because we live in Miami. (laughs) That is so good. A visitor from another planet would assume that the children of our school belong to the Church of Meteorology. (laughs) that, That is good. A quick turn on phrase there. Friends, that's the world our kids are being raised in. Uh, That Christ Jesus is even jettisoned, I mean, catapulted out of the Christmas season itself. Oh, no, 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 we don't, we're not going to say Christmas, not Merry Christmas, it's just, it's enjoy the holiday season. Well, it's a holy day. What's the holy day? God split the heavens and the earth and he's taking upon flesh and blood. Now, I know there's some good Mexican food-loving people in the room. If not, become my friend and soon you will be, okay? The carne guisada. Carne, flesh. But that's exactly what the Bible is saying to you and to me. That at this moment in time, God who transcends time and eternity itself is coming to take on flesh. And he's gonna present the Father. Everything that Jesus the Son, that we're gonna see has always been, has come to make the Father known. So now, for 2,000 years, the world has attempted in some way to explain away the miracle-working man born in literal obscurity in Bethlehem. He was sent away to Egypt in protection of his very life. A few years pass, and finally, as Herod passes away, He comes back to be reared and raised in Nazareth because we know in fulfillment of Scripture, the Bible says he will be called what? A Nazarene. So all of this is not by happenstance. 
God is a God of great intentionality. Your life matters to the Lord intentionally. The Bible says that he foreknew you. I mean, it's incredible just to stop and to think about that. That no matter what tribulations, trials, troubles, you may find yourself in right now, that God is still at work. He's pursuing you in the midst of it. You would hear his voice and say, everything's going to be okay, but you got to just find his peace as you stop and yield to him as Lord, as master. In our Bible, in these 18 verses, this morning, just five verses will be used of God to help us experience what is the unique Christmas story because it speaks of him even before he is taking upon flesh. This morning, I want in this revelation of the Christ of Christmas to reveal in three weeks' time six pictures of the person of Christ at Christmas. And I think this morning, as you look in just two applications, I think we could settle in even if I were worth my salt as a preacher, I could truly take a year to preach through just one of these points, and we would still just be only grabbing the hem of the garment of everything that's there. A friend, this morning, you and I, as Jesus followers, we need to know what we believe and then why we believe it, but then also why it matters for now and eternity. It's, it's truly significant to think about that. As John the Apostle is going to introduce us to these things, I want us, before these three weeks are up, you'd almost say, man, where's my certificate? I want a master's degree for John chapter 1, and I'd almost print it and give it to you because we're going to get that much just good stuff out of this. All right? Let's stand together in the honor of reading the Lord's Word together. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness, amen, has not overcome it. God in heaven. By your Spirit's presence, as we worship you, as we sing Emmanuel, Lord, in coming weeks, all of these great Christmas songs be exalted, Lord. And may today, may the witness be of the gathering of this church that on the, the cardboard story of every one of our lives, that we would yield it to you and we would say that there is nothing greater Nothing more powerful than you to bring victory, to bring new life, to repurpose us, to live for your honor and for your glory. We pray that together in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, church. So this morning, two pictures to begin to get just a glimpse and an understanding of what we need to believe and why we believe it. The first one is this. The Christ child is the eternal one. And I hope you'll write that down in the outline and begin to follow along this morning. The Christ child, Jesus, is the eternal one. Now, why does that matter for you and for me? If you're there in your scripture, if you want to underline it, the first part of verse one, it says, in the beginning, it's no small thing to just somehow uh, run past that, but to see its uh, allusion to just the very beginning of Genesis itself, in the beginning, God. And we're going to see that. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it just simply speaks of the fact that he is the pre-existent one as he is the eternal one. In the beginning, God, his name in the Hebrew, Elohim, which in and of itself is no small statement. It means in the plural sense, the creator God is there. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And some would be quick to say, no, 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 hold on now. Now the Trinity all you Christians, you want to give adherence to this word that's not even found in the Bible. And to which I say, well, neither is the rapture, but I believe in it. I'm going to be caught up. I hope you are too. I mean, there's just stuff out there talking about um, people being overwhelmed by uh, just religious oppression. And they think that they want to associate with it that they're somehow oppressed and made to feel afraid of God because of the teaching of the church upon the rapture of the church. To which I say, amen. 
That's the whole purpose in it. You, can't, you need to get ready. It causes you and I to begin to search out why has God said this? And why has he given this to you and to me, even in this Christmas application? Here we have, and if you read through Matthew's account and Luke's uh, gospel and all of these just beautiful things happening of the announcement of God coming and being born in Bethlehem, that even before that now, as John is announcing it, he goes all the way back even before anything was made. He says, Christ was. You need to know this about him. We need to seek out together why it matters because we live in a world that wants to strip away all of the deity, all of the claim of his Godhead right as to who he is. We as his followers, we need to be able to back it up, book, chapter, and verse that you could open up your Bible and it almost automatically would come to John chapter one. You would be able to make a defense for the gospel of Christ, for the claims of Christ. So in the beginning, what? In the beginning was the word. The word is maybe heard preached before, logos in the Greek. Logos simply meaning the very idea, the very intelligence, the understanding of God and his creative glory and his power is at work there. And then it says the word, who is he? He was God and he was with God. The word was God. So beautiful. Because Jesus then is the eternal one, we see then that he is preexistent, meaning there's never been a time in all of eternity, past, present, and future, where Jesus has not been in existence. The triune God existing, distinct in their person, but yet not in competition with one another. Each understanding their role to play. And so as Jesus, even himself in his self-awareness, knowing who he is in his own eternal essence, understands who he is as the very literal word of God. And so as you begin to work through scripture, even back in Genesis 1, it says out of nothing in the Latin, that's, but I'm going to get to just try to do my best to impress y'all today. Ex nihilo. Well, what's that? It means out of nothing. God speaks. That's what sets God apart from everything else in all the world. You and I talk, and all people say is we're full of hot air. God speaks and something comes into existence. God spoke. The word, Jesus, is there and he's speaking and in his creative might and power, something happens. So in this language, it's significant to see because I want to tell you, church, there are those who stand outside of what we know to be the basic just truth of the gospel narrative of who Jesus Christ is. And because of their errant teaching, heretical teaching, uh, there are great cults that begin to be built and people begin to buy into it and they begin to believe it, book, chapter, and verse, and say, oh, I to, I'm going to believe that, I'm going to follow that. And so somehow Jesus is reduced. He's no longer in equality with God because he is now not one in essence with God the Father. He is just a God. Why? Well, they say because in the Greek there's not the indefinite article. Well, Great, but if you do your homework in an understanding of Greek grammar, and I'm not telling you that I fully grasp at all, but I look into the context of everything that John is writing in this, and when he chose to use the, use the Greek word, I, me, oh, this is where it just gets good, y'all. Because in the imperfect tense, let me read this to you, of this verb, it describes continuous action both in the past, present, and future, reinforcing, though, in his eternal preexistence that he was the Logos. He's always been. He could have chosen a completely different verb tense, meaning that he was becoming God. No, Jesus was not becoming, and he is still not becoming anything. He is in the eternal existence of being. The language, again, is proston theon meaning the word was God, the word was with God. And, and here's the beautiful word picture it gives. It gives the very picture of Jesus and the Father having a conversation face to face, just enjoying the intimacy of relationship and friendship, communing together, understanding their roles. So friends, I wanna tell you, whether it be in the English or whether it be in the Greek, perhaps without any uh, comparison or or competition, this declaration stands out 
above, I believe, any other claim to the Lord's deity than anywhere else in Scripture. Meaning, if you'll come to this, chapter 1, verse 1, and begin to look through it, you see emphatically John as one who would walk with the Lagos, said if you need to know how to begin to make a defense for the truth of the eternal one, know this scripture. In the beginning was the Lagos. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was not a God. The Word was God. Praise the Lord. It matters because when we move into a verse like 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, but in your hearts, if you want to write that verse down, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense for anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness. Do it with respect. Having a good conscience then, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. What is he saying? But that if you and I are just faithful representatives of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you know what you believe and why you believe it. In this moment, you don't stand with a haughty spirit, but in all just contrite understanding that we, we're still haven't gotten over the fact that we're aware of our own just reality. We are crucified with Christ on the cross, that the grace of God that covers me, the shed blood of an atoning work of Christ, is why I'm here today. It's not because of anything I've done or can do. So my hope then, that's what Peter is saying. He's keenly aware of his cardboard testimony. So he says, church, you need to settle this. Honor Christ. How? By living in a way that's so holy. How do you live holy? Being prepared in this way that when the opportunity presents itself, that you're going to speak to the truth of Jesus as the preexistent, holy, eternal one of God. It is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that John chose these precise words that accurately convey the very nature of our Savior, Jesus. He's not a God. He is the God. The truth of Christ's deity, his full equality with the Father, truly, church, it is a non-negotiable element of our Christian faith and our Christian walk. We need to be able to give words to it. That's why Paul wrote in to the church in Galatia, chapter 1, verse 7. He says, There then are some who are disturbing you. They want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even then, if we, or an angel from heaven, and that's significant, there are cults out there that would say, Hey, but an angel spoke to us. So, well, that's great. It's probably Satan himself. It's a demonic angel. If even an angel should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed, anathema. As we have then said before, so I say again, now if any man is preaching a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. So what does that mean? It means that you need to know and to be able to recognize what is outside of biblical truth. And the only way, right, you've heard this said, the best way to know a counterfeit bill, it's not by knowing a counterfeit bill, it's by knowing the original article, right? That's what they teach you to do. Back when I worked at a bank, as a bank teller, when we were church planters, and all my training, it wasn't, let's look at all the different counterfeits. You need to know the original. Look at it. Learn it. Memorize it. Recognize it. Man, there ought to be points in our lives when we hear something you just biblically already know why it doesn't pass the spiritual smell test. Like, I can go book, chapter, and verse and show you where that's wrong. Friends, as we are identifying ourselves as Christ followers, we must be able, oh, how I encourage you as your pastor, to be able to turn in your Bible and to be able, as Peter said, to make a ready defense for the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. It'd be great if you could call on the speed dial, hey, uh, I need my Sunday school teacher, I I need my pastor, sorry. We can't be there all the time, but you can by simply knowing basics of the ABCs. I'm telling you, church, the simple doctrinal truth of God's heart to your heart. You remember the story of Stephen? I love when you get into the book of Acts. Stephen was one of those young uh, deacons, man, just serving the church, just loving Jesus. And the religious folks, those people that had crucified Jesus, they hated what God was doing in this new thing called the church, the People of the way, meaning people who were followers of Jesus. 
And Stephen began to just shuck the corn, y'all. I mean, he was flat preaching it. He was laying it down. He was bringing them through a historical background of everything through the Old Testament. Everything, I'm telling you, chapter by chapter, that God had done to protect the coming of the Messiah. And then, it, I mean, it reaches the apex, I mean, the, this, the summit of his sermon. And he says, and you are the ones who crucify the Lord of glory. And it says at that point, they picked up stones as they laid their, their robes at the feet of Saul, this promising Pharisee. And they stoned Stephen to death. The Bible says, y'all, I tell y'all, I have such, this is where, when I, I have to just glue myself to this platform, it just gets so good to think of it. I won't come bouncing off of it. The Bible says that in that moment that the Son of God, he's not sitting down anymore. He's standing. And he's just in awe of the faithfulness of Stephen. And he's just getting ready to say, welcome home. Welcome home, that you willingly, one of the first martyrs, because of his simple belief in the claims that Jesus made of himself to be the very literal Son of God, which is claim to being God. Friends, Jesus, the Christ child, is the Son of God. And we unashamedly stand in this place week in and week out, and we make that declaration, the songs we sing, the sermons that are preached, the testimonies that are given, that we unashamedly, we believe that Jesus is the sent one of God, the Messiah, the Christ child, meaning anointed for one purpose, to take upon flesh and blood, to live his life as a sinless uh, lamb of God, that he might lay his life down. Well, why do we worship him? Because his name alone is worthy to be worshiped. Praise God. For Jesus as the eternal one, the pre-existent one, the one who stands above and beyond. Friends, I'm telling you, the beauty of the scriptures this morning are so profound that we see Jesus as the word of God. He's also the wisdom of God. He's personified in this way in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 27. It says that when he, meaning Jesus, the son of God, as revealed in Genesis chapter 1, when Jesus established the heavens, he says the wisdom of God was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned the sea its limits so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he commanded and he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman. I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting then in the children of man. Friends, man, that's just in Proverbs. You see the continuity of the way the Spirit of God is working from Genesis through the Psalms, through Proverbs, now into the Gospel of John to say the wisdom of God, the logos of God is hemmed up, it's wrapped up, and that little baby in those swaddling clothes born in obscurity in Bethlehem, but friends, in that moment, he is still at work. He is fulfilling Everything of what he said would happen. Oh, you Bethlehem. You just little dot on the map in the Middle East. You've been forgotten. And out of him is born the Savior of the world. Friends, only God could write that story. Oh, well, you know, he did. Y'all, that was supposed to be funny, y'all. All right, anyhow. Number two. First, the Christ child is the eternal one. Second, the Christ child is the revealed one. Verse four, in him, meaning Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness. The darkness, praise God, has not overcome it. So what we see, John is saying, that life and light are synonymous. Jesus' words and his works together are synonymous. They come together. Everything that he's saying, because if you're listening to me, know this. Everything that I say is what I've heard the Father say. Everything that I'm doing is a reflection of the very character and the nature of the Father. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to reveal the Father as he is the Son of God. So we see in the language there that Jesus says, in him was, like John says of him, in him was life. Once again, going back to Genesis chapter one, God creates out of nothing, he makes Adam, and then it says his spirit hovers over him, the very ruach, 
In the Hebrew, the very picture of that understanding, it is a life essence. In the Greek language, it's zoe, life, meaning without it, there is no life. You're empty. There's nothing that you can do. Paul alludes to that, to his letter in the church in Ephesus. You were lifeless upon the table, but God breathed life into you. The moment when we repent of our sins and we place faith in the accomplishment of Christ through the cross, through a tomb that's empty, life is what is born into us. In the same identity of the very spiritual life, this lump of clay now becomes a living, created being by the creator of God himself. So the question to you this morning is that your personal testimony that you know without any doubt that you've been born again, that you have spiritual life in your bones. Jesus is life. As he is light, he is also able to stand, if he were here before us, describing how he is completely 100% self-existent. He is in that way because he is the very definition of life. He sustains it. Again, the synonym, light, you turn a light on, I dare you to bring enough darkness to try to suppress the power of one light. Can't do it. Light has one purpose. It illuminates. It rebukes. It invades. It overcomes. And that's who Jesus is presented as the Son of God. And at Christmas time, man, we drive around and our kids, I say, Mommy, Daddy, I want to go see the lights. I'm like, okay, this weekend. My kid's been on me. I, I just, I don't know, I just... I'm afraid, y'all, of heights. Well, I realize I got two monkeys that love to jump on top of, of my house. Mainly that's Peyton and Ashlyn. I just need to buy the lights and say, y'all do it. Put them up there. <laughs> Why? Wow, there's something just fun about seeing the lights. We want to drive around and see lights on houses and, and at times the animated ones and just be lost in the excitement of the season. But what are the lights' purpose to do? Somehow they're pointing with a great message that the light of God is directed for a purpose, to lead us into his truth. And that's what I'm preaching this morning. What are, you, what are we doing with the truth that we know as stewards, that we know the truth that God has given to you? I mean, come on, y'all. <laughs> Some of y'all been coming to church when Moby Dick was a minnow. You ought to be able to stand up here and preach this message. You know it. You live it. We live in this dark world and we have the light of life, Jesus, that illuminates in us the words we say, the things we do. Listen, friend, I know, there's not one of us. I'm not saying well, I'm not perfect enough. I know there's not one of us perfect. Praise God for the covering of the blood of Christ. But what are we to point people to but to the truth that you can try to suppress it Good luck. You can't. Truth is absolute. And truth has a name. It is Jesus. Because of who he is, there is great comfort in knowing that he is the unchanging one. The Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says in the gospel narrative that you and I are now little lights. Go, therefore, then, to all the world and shine Shine for the glory, the only one who is worthy to be called glorious, Jesus, the Christ of God. Praise him that he is the light of God. And as God's light, he has one purpose, and that is to manifest Christ himself. John 8, verse 12 says, I then am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of Life. John 14, verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So as a follower, Jesus follower, what is he saying? He's saying that he is the only exclusive way. He is the only admittance into the presence of the Father. Everybody talking about, I want to go to heaven, but they don't want to come on God's terms. The Bible is very clear. There is a way. It's a narrow way, but praise God, there's a way. John says, I am that way. I am that truth, and I am that life. So follower then, you and I 
We must become, we must be, each and every one of us emboldened to share then that explicit gospel of Christ. You say, well, Pastor, what do you you mean by explicit gospel? I mean that you and I being able to turn book, chapter, and verse to reflect the the life, burial, and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, friends, that if anything less than that, you have settled for just mediocrity in regards to your Christian faith. If you're not pursuing that, I'm telling you, you need to step up today. You and I together, based upon what I'm telling you, what Scripture is saying, Jesus is worth that kind of pursuit. It's not just for the pastor, not just for the Sunday school, Bible school leader, not for just the vacation Bible school director, and it's certainly not for your children's teachers so that they take responsibility for it. No, mom, dad, it's you. Praise God that we have that opportunity. And I'm going to tell you, friends, don't give up. Don't yield over that responsibility. Be found faithful as a mom and dad. Keep loving in tender moments of just teachable moments of opportunity to teach those spiritual truths to the hearts of your children. So, friends, I I want to tell this story to try to bring application to this. How many of y'all like going into caves? Let me just be honest. Any of y'all cave dwellers, cave divers, all that? I mean, some of y'all just... You, I think you crave adrenaline. Y'all just go for it. And y'all are like the green berets of the spiritual world, and I praise God for you. Uh, I, I think, you know, some of my family are like that. I'm not. I'm always the cautious one. Ah, let, let's see somebody else do it first. <laughs> well, we went uh, two summers ago as a family on a trip to Colorado. We went to a place called the Cave of the Winds. And uh, we joined in with a group of about 16 other people, and we stopped. And, I, you know, I think they do, even beyond just wanting to sell you the picture, uh, somehow there's evidence that, yes, uh, this number of people in this family went into the caves, and they came out. Nobody left behind. You get through this, and there's a section. If you were to have to start walking from here, pretty much almost way to the parking lot and beyond, you're having to walk like this. You know, I'm, a, I'm not 100% claustrophobic, but maybe 99% claustrophobic. And I'm hunkered down like, you know, this would be an easy for an old fat guy, you know. <laughs> I'm like, huh? And I stop by halfway through, and we get, they wear us out getting you through that tunnel. And they bring you into this large room, and, you know, we've all got our little lanterns, and she's telling her memorized little story and trying to scare the bejeebies out of us of how this portion of the cave is haunted, like, whatever. Of course, you know me, the mischievous one, and I'm in the back, and I start going, you know, all the little kids in the group, stop it! (laughs) And all of a sudden, the tour guide stopped talking, and she turned the lights out. That got my attention real quick. You know, at at 40, you know, something years of age, I'm like, Okay, this, we're out having fun. She's going to turn the lights off. But then I'm going to think, but just how long is she going to let this go on? And I'm telling her, she let it go on. And on. And then finally, I'm going to tell you, my heart was just about to really get turned on, get going. The lights came back on. I mean, it was so dark. It's right where you, even when your eyes begin to just think, okay, the darkness is going to, your eyes are going to adjust to the darkness. No, that didn't happen. I mean, I was hitting my nose. (laughs) I can't see. But when the light turned on, there was no competition for the light. No matter how dark. Friends, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the person of Christ. I love what the great uh, preacher, uh, preacher and pastor Charles Spurgeon, he said this. Don't try to defend scripture. It's like a lion. You don't need to defend a lion. It'll defend itself. Just cut it loose. Get to the word. The word will defend itself. Because it is light. It is life. So this passage this morning, just five verses out of the 18 we will examine in these weeks. Two simple pictures, but are so important for you and for me to make application. That's what I want to do at this point. As we think of the Christ child who is the eternal one and the Christ child who is the revealed one, praise God. 
that he has been revealed. He's been made known for you and for me now to walk with him in a love relationship and then now to advance the truth of what we have experienced and what we have encountered. So I want to ask you, as you think about your own relationship with Christ, how significant of a thing is this question? Does it matter to you to know the truth of Jesus? Have you personally come to grips with your own responsibility to be able to speak of the gospel good news, of knowing who Jesus is? By your own practice, by your own belief, here's the question. Have you assigned Jesus a place in the nativity scene, but you're not giving him lordship and the place of authority in your heart and in your mind, which leads you to a willingness to give words, to speak to who Jesus is? I mean, church, think of the dangers associated with that spiritual attitude. If you and I choose in complacency and indifference, spiritual just apathy, that we're just, we're just not in a place, yes, we want to celebrate Christmas, and we want to sing Christmas carols, but would we get so just in love and enthralled with the Christ of Christmas because he is the eternal one, because he is the revealed one, that now we're, we're being moved out of this complacency to see this, is, this matters to the now, and it matters for the eternity. So I appeal to you this morning, based upon these scriptures, I want to challenge us to think of it in this way. Why does it matter? First, it matters, I think, of supreme significance, because most people today are ignorant of this one great reality. I want you to listen to this. In this moment of Christmas, we see Jesus coming as the gentle son of God, if you will, born in Bethlehem. But he will be reared and then ultimately laying his life down as a sacrificial lamb. But the Bible story doesn't stop there. What we know from Scripture is that ultimately Jesus will come again as the eternal judge. And he alone then has the authority to separate the sheep from the goats. To cast those who never knew him, out of his presence and based upon what scripture says, they will enter into a forever place empty of the Christ of Christmas, of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 says, Then I saw a great white throne in him then who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in those books according to what they also had done. And the sea gave up their dead who were in it. Death, Hades, gave up the dead who were in them. And they too were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. What is the scripture saying? He's saying it matters. What you believe matters. But then not just what you believe, what you do with it. Second, would you and I today, this morning, be willing to say, God, I'm at that place now. I recognize it is my responsibility. I need to be able to make a defense for the truth of the gospel, of the person of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to the church in Rome, Romans 1 verse 16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Praise God. Would you be willing to be ready? Third, now then, become a student of the scriptures. Meet yourself getting up early in the morning, meditating throughout the watches of the day, concluding your day with a time spent in scripture that you can rightly divide the word of God and then be able to share it with someone else. Second Timothy chapter four, verse three says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, think about that, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions who will turn away from listening to the truth and they will wander off into myths. I want you to listen to this statement. People may choose not to believe you. They may choose not to believe what you believe about Jesus Christ but they may never be able to believe correctly unless you and I 
make a defense for the biblical truth of who Jesus is. And there are so many people who are simply waiting to simply have that opportunity to have the gospel presented to them, the truth of the person of Christmas. Yesterday afternoon, we had opportunity to gather with a number of folks to celebrate a life, a family that came to celebrate Jerry Walker's life, story after story. But you know where it all led up to? After all the Bible studies and all the gatherings with the men coming together where the word of God was opened, it finally culminated when Jerry Walker at some point realized, even in conversation with his own son, that if he were to have died that day, his eternity would be spent forever away from God. And so he cried out to one of his new friends, Vaughn, I want to pray to ask Jesus to be my Lord, to be my Savior. Does it matter, friends? Oh, it matters. Matthew's gospel tells a story of three simple wise men who are simply seeking out Jesus. It says that in verse, chapter 2, verse 2, where is he? who has been born king of the Jews. You've heard this story. For we saw a star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. And after listening then to King Herod, they went on their way. And then behold, the star that they had seen, it rose, it went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly. It means they were excited. (laughs) They were overcome with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And it says, they fell down and they worshiped him. Opening the treasures, offering him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And the three wise men knew that God was then at work. They followed all of the celestial aspects of the stars, even the movings of the planets. And why does this matter? Friends, hear this before we get ready to leave this room. Because God in this moment is moving stars. He's moving planets. At this moment, no. Before anything was made, the Son of God, with the Father God, and the Spirit of God, when he spoke it, he put everything into place like a clock in eternity, just ticky. He knew in the fullness of time, as if to say, as Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, that the time itself was pregnant. And now, the angel's watching. Hey, 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 something's happening, y'all. Something's happening. God's doing something. His redemptive plan was now reaching a whole new level of excitement. The apex of it, the summit, if you will. Planets are moving. They're coming into alignment. All of these things. And now, those who watch the stars walk in the earth, they're saying there's something different about these movements. God's doing something. Friends, I ask you this morning, what is God moving in your life? Maybe you're in a dark place and you need to see in the darkness God is shining the light. He's moving in your life, even in difficult circumstances to say you've not been forgotten. That even in Christmas time, in moments of years even gone by, you've lost loved ones, you've seen friends go away, whatever it may be. Don't miss what God is doing in this day, right now, to lead you and to lead me to be walking with him, to know what we believe and why we believe it. Now to you this morning, who've never trusted Christ as your Lord and your Savior, it is a privilege as a pastor here at Macedonia uh, to represent our church family, to say to you, clearly we're glad you're here as our guest, but we want you to hear the gospel before you leave. Jesus is the Son of God. He claimed it over and over and over again. And as the Son of God, he was supernaturally born of the Holy Spirit of God through a virgin woman. Explain that. I can, only God can. Why did he, why was it necessary? Because he must be sinless. The sin seed of man was not passed down through Joseph. 
In the fullness of what was prophesied in Scripture, Jesus is now born of the Father God by the Spirit of God in a virgin woman, and he lives a, sinner's li- a sinless life in the place for you and for me as a sinner. He dies upon the cross, offering himself up as sin sacrifice for you and for me. He does what you and I can't do. If you and I died on the cross, it makes no difference. But God dying upon the cross makes every difference. The sinless Lamb of God drinks fully the cup of God's wrath and he takes it upon himself and redirects it away from you and me. My friends, only God can write something and do something so magnificent and so beautiful that through the cross, through his death, being buried, but yet three days later being raised to life again, he offers you the opportunity this morning to own up to the reality. The Bible says that every one of us, and that includes you, you're a sinner, but you can become a saint today. Not based upon anything you can do, but what God has already done through his son, Jesus. Receive him into your heart. Say, well, how do I do that? It's a confession, a prayer of faith that says, Jesus, I do. I confess I'm a sinner, and I want Jesus to be my Lord and my Savior. Do that this morning. Maybe you're here this morning. You just need a church home, a place to belong. We welcome you to come. You need to be in a church where the word of God is being preached, where Christ is being exalted, lives are being changed. And you can add your story to his glory and live for him, part of a local church being used of him to brightly shine the light of Jesus Christ. The altar's open. Maybe just this morning you need to come and renew your commitment to Christ. Maybe you need to let that be known to your church family. Maybe you've been walking at just a guilty distance from the Lord and God's drawn you back in his just cords of kindness. It's time to get serious about God. Time to start walking with him shine his light. Jesus, the eternal one, the revealed one, would you come to him today? Let's pray. Hey everybody, it's Pastor Chris. Just want to say thanks for watching today. I hope you were encouraged in your relationship with Christ from everything that was taught and said in the service. Listen, as a church family, we're praying for you and honored to have you as a part of our church family, whether you're with us here on campus or online as a participant through our web uh, ministry. So go to MacBC, stay connected for updated information. And as well, you can always reach out to us, whether a phone call or an email, and let us know how we can be in prayer for you or how we can send you information and resources to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. All right, we love you the Lord, and we look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you.